hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this session we are uh, going to talk about the uh, eBay geo distributed database on Kubernetes. We uh, come from eBay. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Xing Lang. I worked in the eBay data platform team. Uh, actually, I'm a Kubernetes user, I'm not a Kubernetes developer. And uh, this topic includes uh, two parts. And here's uh, today's agenda. So first, I will introduce the eBay geo distributed database. I will share the experience of how we deploy such a database on the Kubernetes. The second part, my colleague Chen Yuan, he's from eBay Kubernetes team. He will do a deep dive on the storage management in Kubernetes at eBay. We did a few extensions on the uh, storage part on top of the Kubernetes. And this is the core, core things to support us can run in the database on top of the Kubernetes. Uh, so first, let me start from the vision of the eBay Geo Distributed Database. As you know, eBay, uh, our vision is we want people to shop any item from eBay, from any place, any time, via any device. So we have the requirement to want the data close to the user. So that's why we developed the Geo Distributed Database. And the vision of the, this database is we want to provide a resilient, cloud-native and cost-effective data platform to support eBay close, uh, global business. So we want it uh, always available, and also it can be highly scalable kind of so, to support the business group. And also it should be high performance. Since we deployed on a cloud-native environment, so we also want to, uh, 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 operation agility. We want to, everything can be fully automated. Otherwise, uh, it cannot survive if, if we uh, don't have this automation on our cloud-native environment. So this is our vision of our uh, GEO distributed database in eBay. So now let's look at how it looks like. So actually, our distribution, uh, GEO distributed database idea is quite similar like other uh, distributed database. So why we want to uh, distributed database is just that the data set is too large. We cannot fit in one node. So distributor actually have two meanings. One, we want to split the large data set to a small chunk of the data set. In this case, we call it a, a shard. Actually, it's a shard on a range of, a, of a key range. And physically, we call this a replica set. This is a, a replica set in our database, not the same as the replica set concept in the Kubernetes. But it's quite similar. So each shard actually contains a small range. It's just a small data set of the global data set. And we, the second of the distribution says we want this data have a few copies. And these copies will be distributed on multiple machines on different zones. So that's the, the logical view of a, a distributed database. Uh, now the, I have a graph to show uh, how it uh, physically deployed in a, a real uh, environment. So the database will deploy it on the multiple zones. On the bottom layer, we call it the storage layer. The storage layer is just uh, many uh, storage nodes. Each node is a uh, bare metal machine. Uh, it's a physical hardware. In each storage node, we uh, spawn a few uh, database engine process on this uh, storage node. In the graph, the same color actually means the data copy is the same, and the number I put in here just means the shard ID of the, of, of, of the uh, data. So uh, logically, a uh, shard, for example, the, the, the number two uh, shard, it will be in the first and the second and the fourth uh, node. Actually, this storage layer is quite large. The scale I talk about in here is will be thousands of these uh, database engines. So how our application to access this uh, database data to the read write? Since we have thousands of the storage engines on the storage layer, we cannot let the application to connect to that directly. So we introduce a service layer. This service layer to uh, routing the application request to the, uh, the storage layer uh, database engines. So this service layer, actually it is stateless. But how it can do the routing? Actually, we have uh, in the service layer, it have a topology map to know the layout of the storage layer. But how did it know this layout? We, uh, in the left side, we call the orchestration layer. We have a coordinator. This uh, coordinates the service layer and the storage layer. 
the coordinator actively uh, monitor all of the, uh, actually it may control all of the storage engines on the storage layer. It manages the state and manages the change, and it has its own mandated stored storage the state. Meanwhile, the coordinator also uh, pushes this change to the service layer. So that will make the service layer can know in our topology layout, the physical layout of the storage layer. Then the, it can route in the request based on this uh, topology map. Meanwhile, we also have the monitoring system because sometimes for the, this storage engine, it may have some uh, slowdown or has some other problems. So this monitoring system also uh, monitor, actively monitor the database engines in the storage layer and it just sends some signal in case something is a failure to the coordinator and the coordinator take, take some action. So now what I have talking about is just for a GEO distributed database, but how it relates to the Kubernetes. So actually we deploy a whole things, include the storage layer and also orchestration layer on the Kubernetes. So on the orchestration layer and the service layer, actually it's a, typically it's most uh, stateless, so it's not a big problem when we deploy it on the Kubernetes. The core part is how we manage these storage things on the Kubernetes. We know Kubernetes is great, but uh, is it easy to deploy such a complex state workload on Kubernetes? The answer is uh, it's not easy. So now I'm going to talk about uh, when we implement such a database, we found a few challenges in, uh, challenges when we deploy it on Kubernetes. So the first one is uh, we are talking about a distributed database. We have geo distribution. So typically we will deploy these things on multiple clusters. Uh, typically Kubernetes is just on a local availability zone or on a local data center, it's just one cluster. So first we face each uh, problem is we have to manage multiple Kubernetes clusters. We need to distribute our database engines on multiple clusters. So once we deploy on the multiple clusters, we know Kubernetes has its own internal network. Inside it can have a good connectivity. But uh, for, if you cross multiple clusters, like I have a database that has a, a three copies on two data centers, it want, want to do some real-time reputation. So that is, we have the second issue is how we uh, enable the network connectivity between the database engines on different clusters. So that's the second uh, uh, problem on the network side. Uh, since we are talking about we are want to do a high performance, a cost effective data platform. So, but uh, on Kubernetes by default, uh, if we want the persistent data, we use the persistent volume. But persistent volume typically is uh, shared remote storage. But if we want to get a high performance, cost effective, this cannot uh, fulfill our requirement because remote typically means slow, it may be low IOPS, and the shared means sometimes people can, uh, some the process running on same storage will impact each other. And the next one is uh, we present the data and uh, we want to, a few data, we want to control the data placement because we are running our database, we don't want to same copy running on same machines, that will be a risk. So actually we want to know that data location, we want to control the data placement. And, this, and another thing is we want to do some optimi optimization. For example, when I wrote in the, the request from our service layer to, to our storage layer, we want to choose some closed data node that can minimize the latency. So the database is more than like a pad. It's a very complex uh, pad. We need more control of whole things. And uh, the next one is uh, in the database, we manage the data. It's not just like your deployment. You have a pod is, is gone. You create another new pod to add to the deployment. We, are, we not only need to create the uh, pod, we also need to move the data from somewhere to restore the data. So uh, the change is we need some data lifecycle management. It includes like a data backup or data movement between a few uh, uh, database engines. So this is uh, the main challenges we faced when we trying to deploy such a workload on the Kubernetes. So now let's look at how we uh, resolve this issue. So uh, on, on eBay, uh, actually we have a, a little bit advanced than the community. So uh, I just saw the, the CNI, the container network interface. 
So this maybe can also uh, support uh, the requirement like we, we did in eBay. So in eBay, we assign each port as a global IP. So that will make us can, on different uh, Kubernetes cluster, the port have the network activity. So we have a controller. When I schedule a port, it will assign a global IP. And this global IP is a global routable between the different clusters. So, so this will resolve the, the network connectivity issues. And the next, uh, we found if we want to use a very high performance, a very high IOPS, and also a very dedicated uh, uh, volumes, we found that only the local disk or the disk just uh, maybe on the same rack can be mounted like uh, I discussed in this local sense. Can we can achieve this high LPS and also uh, dedicated uh, without any impact for other neighbors? So uh, this, uh, by collaboration with our eBay Kubernetes teams, we utilize the local disk as a persistent volume. That means we can request the, the uh, persistent volume, and but uh, actually it uh, return a local disk to this port. And meanwhile, uh, uh, when we register this persistent volume as a local disk. We put our uh, physical location info, like the rack and the host, inside the, as the labels for the local uh, persistent volumes. Then can allow us, in the application layer, we know the location of this uh, disk and uh, uh, to know uh, which rack it is and which host it is. Meanwhile, we uh, enhanced the, actually this is also done by our Kubernetes team. They enhanced the, just Port of the anti affinity features from the, the port level to the volume level. Because when we schedule some things, we will maybe first I need a persistent volume, then I schedule a port. So we have some special implementation can also support the volume level anti affinity. That means I, for a uh, for same shard data, I don't want to, this shard, the two persistent volumes not in a, a same host or a same rack. So this will uh, make us can get the high LPS. Uh, we can make our database high performance. Also, we can support the anti-affinity, this uh, location sense. And next one is uh, we found when we do the database, the database always need as a backup. If we don't have a backup, if something is broken, even we have a multiple copy, but we don't have the, like, the time machine capability to know the history of the data. So the data backup is sort of quite important for us. Uh, we have a solution to, uh, to utilize the local disk. This just like a device. On the device level, we do the snapshot and keep sending the snap, uh, delta to, uh, to sync it to a network volume. And use this mechanism to, for our backup. This local disk can, can, can still work with the high IOPS, and then it uh, just keep doing the regular delta and the remote volume. Because if we, you just use the remote shared storage, you can maybe do the snapshot on the remote shared storage. But if, since we know, now we use the local disk, so we have additional this, uh, features to enable this backup things. And now, this is just on the infrastructure level. We reserve the network issue and also reserve the disk issues. But we found that after we utilize this feature, we are not only uh, we cannot use like a deployment or server set because this just means Kubernetes can control your port life cycle. Now I cannot utilize because we have very special things like uh, I need to control the local disk, the disk and the port must be uh, together. It cannot utilize these features. So we so then we choose a solution. We call it just use the port. We use uh, Kubernetes to just manage these containers, and uh, on the up layer we create our own orchestration layer to maintain the WSB state. So that is the uh, orchestration layer I mentioned in uh, previous slides. Just we maintain our WSB state. So, but how we can maintain the WSB state? So first we have our own configured uh, store to store our uh, desired state. We also actively monitor all of the physical resources in the Kubernetes. Then we compare the difference to, uh, to take some action, we build uh, like a loop. That's why we watch the Kubernetes change and take some action to, fix, to make it match our desired state. But this is different like a 
uh, Kubernetes will always be more like a cross multiple data center, cross multiple Kubernetes clusters, and then maintain the WSB in our own, uh, via our own data store. Also, we utilize a, a thing we call the workflow to maintain the WSB, because uh, like uh, I said before, we have uh, a few like a data, data, move, data operation and also Kubernetes operation. This is uh, together. Sometimes I, I do uh, create a new port, I need to move some data. So not just like a, a very simple uh, operation. It has a, a few complex steps. So we utilize the workflow mechanism to implement these uh, complex things and maintain this USB state. Now here is an example for how I do the self-remediation. For uh, in this example, for, I have a replica. Uh, this is maybe the host is down, Kubernetes uh, deleted this uh, replica, this is in the red. And we all watch, we watch this event, we get it to be deleted. This event will be sent to our coordinator, and our coordinator will, uh, actually we have two level co coordinators, each zone have its own local one. This will avoid uh, the uh, one data center down impact others. But we have a logically global one, actually it also distributed on multiple data centers. So this local one will forward the event to the global one, and the global one will make the decision, and it will trigger the, work, uh, trigger the WCB workflow. The WCB workflow will find, that, okay, I have one replica is missing. I just uh, send, the mass event, uh, send a call to the local coordinator to create a new replica added to this uh, shard. So this is uh, quite similar like how Kubernetes works, but we just expanded on uh, multiple uh, Kubernetes clusters. So here's uh, all of my uh, talk. Actually, I just share uh, our eBase GeoDB database and uh, how we, uh, the challenges we're facing when we move on Kubernetes and uh, how we solve these uh, challenges. And, uh, uh, and the core part of our solution actually is based on eBay. Kubernetes storage management solution. And I also think our, this pattern is quite a typical, and maybe can be extended to other high LPS GU display the suitable workload. So that's all my part. I will forward to my uh, colleague Chen Yue for the next part. Thank you. OK, thanks, Xin Lang. Uh, my name is Chen Yue. I'm from eBay Kubernetes team. My working domain is on uh, OS management and volume management on the eBay Kubernetes cluster. Uh, next, I'll give introduction of uh, uh, storage management on eBay Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it supports a geo distributed data database. It can also support other eBay application as well. And here is the uh, agenda of my topics. Here, uh, first, uh, I will introduce our storage classes. Next, I will introduce our local volume solution Network, network volume solution, backup solution. Lastly, I will give a simple summary of our future work. Okay, storage classes. Uh, in our Kubernetes cluster, we define two storage class. First is the performance. It can provide 50K IOPS and also maximum 500 megabyte per second uh, throughput. The typical user case is a NoSQL database or some other eBay in-house application. The storage backend is local SSD. On Kubernetes, it's uh, our local SSD volume. The second storage class is a standard. It can provide the 300 LPS, or maximum 300 meg megabytes per second throughput. And the user case, uh, like a backup service, or eBay CI CD, that Kasi and Xiaogang introduced yesterday session. Uh, the storage backend is a CF HDD based uh, uh, class. In Kubernetes, it's uh, our single volume. Okay, then go to the local volume. We started the, our local volume work last year. At that time, there's a quite many network volume solution in Kubernetes, but no local volume. Uh, we compared the network volume. We found that we still have quite many strong reasons that we must implement local volume. Um, first is the performance. It actually, I think it's uh, quite common sense that uh, local SSD performance must be better than network volume. Uh, I think especially for the IO latency. We have data test that uh, if we write a 4KB block on local SSD, it takes about 200 nanoseconds. Uh, why if we write it on the uh, 
seen the ASCASI volume, it take about 1,800 nanoseconds. Uh, so, so performance uh, local SSD is much better. Second is cost. Uh, we all know that uh, commercial high performance network, network storage is very costly. Uh, third reason is the availability. Uh, I think uh, we, most of us will think that uh, one local SSD so reliability is not good, and uh, compared with network volume, its uh, availability uh, is uh, not good as well. But, uh, in our, but actually, I think nowadays, most uh, distributed database actually management the data availability by their own. They usually have several copies on different nodes, on different disks. So that means uh, the data availability is guaranteed by the application level. So single uh, SSD's reliability uh, is not a big issue now. Uh, also, at that time, Kubernetes only provide the MTDR and the host pass as the way for um, pod to ac access local disk. But uh, uh, these two volume also has uh, quite obvious limitation. So first, they don't support PV and PVC. Uh, second, they cannot guarantee their use size or IOPS. Uh, for instance, if a host pass share the same disk with the root FS, uh, the pod maybe can use all the disk space on the root disk uh, root, uh, root FF, FS. So, as as this reason, we start to implement our own local volume. Uh, majorly, we do these three changes in Kubernetes code to implement our local volume. The first part is the uh, uh, local volume plugin. We implemented this plugin to support uh, hard disk and uh, hard disk partition. Uh, this local volume plugin is uh, similar as uh, all other Kubernetes uh, volume plugin. Uh, we implemented the major local vo uh, major volume in interfaces like mounter, unmounter, provisioner, and deleter. And so we registered this uh, volume plugin in the kubelet and the kube controller so that it works as uh, similar as all other uh, volume plugin in the Kubernetes. Second thing, uh, we implement PV and PVC. So uh, user can just create one PVC uh, for the local volume and uh, use this PVC in their power spec, uh, same as the all other PVC. For the PV creation, currently we sub only support stat static PV creation. So during the node provision, we will generate a config file. In this config file, we will indicate which partition or which disk can be used as the local volume. So when kubelet starts, it will read this configuration file and uh, mm, it will uh, create uh, the uh, PV instance in the ETCD and also mount the disk on the, local, uh, on the host node. Uh, just like uh, this, these two disks. So we can mount them first on the host, and when the pod start, these two disks can be mounted in the pod's namespace so that this pod can access the disk directly. Uh, the last part uh, is uh, uh, changes in the scheduler. Uh, the reason is that uh, uh, local volume PV and PVC bonding is, uh, is special. It's not the same as uh, other network volume PV and PVC bonding. Uh, the reason is that uh, when, whenever local volume PV and PVC are bounded, it means that uh, the node is also selected. This will break the later pod scheduling policies. So, so the, in this reason, we, we postpone the PV and PVC bounding uh, in, in the scheduler instead of in the PV controller. Uh, we did two changes. First is that we add a local volume predict function so in this function, we will check uh, every node uh, it, if it can fulfill the requirements of pod's local volume requests. And second is that uh, we in the Kubernetes scheduler one function, we do the final PV and PVC bounding just behind the um, pod bounding to the node. So uh, all these three changes uh, uh, in Kubernetes for us to implement a local volume. Uh, here is an example that uh, uh, how can we use in the local volume PVC in our production? So we just uh, define a local volume PVC. I think uh, 
at the storage class as local SSD. Uh, it, it's uh, similar as the other PVC, and in the part spec, we just put the PV name, PVC name there. So that's it. Uh, here are several um, parts that we ever considered during our design and the implementation of local volume. Uh, first thing is still the where to do the PV bonding. I've mentioned before, if we need to do the PV and PVC bonding in the pod scheduler or do it in the PV controller. Uh, as mentioned before that, if we do it in the PV controller, then it will break a lot of pod um, scheduling policy. Like uh, uh, our customer geo distributed database, they require the uh, anti-affinity feature and also they define the pod memory and the CPU resource, these kind of scheduling requests. So uh, we must uh, fulfill these requirements. So this uh, make us postpone the PV and PVC to the scheduler. Another thing is that uh, some features, some PV features will be, implementation will be more complex if we put this PV and PVC in the PV controller. Uh, just like if one pod requires two uh, local volume PVC, so if we do it in the PV controller, then it's possible that uh, uh, one PVC bound to node A, another PVC bound to node B. Then how can this part be scheduled? So as this kind of reason, so we decide to put this uh, uh, PV bounding in the scheduler. And the second point is that uh, how do we recycle the local volume? So when the PVC is deleted, we also must delete the data on the um, PV. Uh, this actually, we, we at the very beginning, we just start using the recycle pod way. So whenever we uh, delete PVC, we start a local uh, start a pod and schedule this pod to this node. So using this part to, to remove all the data on the uh, specified uh, PV. Uh, at, at the very beginning, we are worried about uh, its scalability, uh, but we tested uh, and to delete 3,000 PVC at one time. And we found that uh, this uh, solution can still work well, so we keep it uh, in our production still. And the third point is about uh, disk failure monitoring and, and the remediation. And we know that uh, mm, disk actually is the most unreliable device in, in the machine compared with the memory, uh, CPU, network interface. So its failure rate is high. So Currently, our solution is that we start a demon set port and uh, uh, call the read con uh, uh, yeah, some read controller uh, CTL, like Max AI or Smart CTL, these tools to detect a disk failure. And uh, whenever we detect a disk failure and we send, uh, send out uh, alerts. Uh, for the remediation part, currently, we, we, can still manual we can only still do the manual remediation. And this maybe will be improved later. Okay, then we will go to the network volume. Uh, I think network volume still plays a very important role in our uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, one of the most important uh, feature for the network volume is that uh, it can attach to a node. So, uh, but when, whenever the pod is uh, deleted or uh, crashed, so if a user wants to start a new pod on another node, the, this network volume can still be reattached to another node and the, the pod can still use this same network volume. Uh, this is a, one of the most uh, important feature of network volume in Kubernetes. And second thing is that uh, I think uh, when, when users are using the network volume, uh, they, they, they suppose the, all the data availability has been guaranteed by the back end of network volume, like, like Ceph. So they don't need to care too much about uh, uh, there are applications how to um, guarantee the data availability and will make uh, user much, thing, uh, much easier. So this is the reason that uh, we, we still need to keep the network volume in our production environment. Uh, We're we, we using the single volume as our network volume solution. Mm, at the very beginning, we're using the standard OpenStack single volume, but uh, after one year's uh, uh, user experience, we found that uh, um, it has some problem. Uh, first is that it has too many, depend, depends on uh, third party components. And second is that it cannot support bare metal. So as this reason, we switched to using uh, 
standalone single provisioner uh, from, from Kubernetes community. Okay, so this figure shows uh, two different solutions. The left side, we can see that uh, this is the standard Cinder plus Nova solution. Uh, this is a Kubernetes node. It's a VM. We can see how many components it depends when it's want to do the volume attach detach. We can see he has a QMU, Novel Computer, RabbitMQ, Novel, and Cinder. So in production, so every two of these components, if they have some data drift, then will cause our volume attach detach failure. It uh, occurs quite often in our production environment. That's the reason we switch to standalone Cinder provisioner. So by using Cinder standard alone uh, stand along Cinder provisioner, uh, we can still uh, let user to use in the Cinder PVC interface, but when user create a standard uh, PVC interface, actually the standalone provisioner can help you create a RBD or ASCASI PV in the uh, Kubernetes side. So it has much less third party dependency and uh, it can improve the uh, Network volumes attached to attached reliability. Okay, then we go to the backup solution. Mm, currently, our backup solution is uh, based on uh, seeing, the, seeing the volume. Our storage team, uh, Safe team, has already implemented a snapshot controller. So, like here, they have run a snapshot controller for each uh, Cinder cluster. So, so when user create a, a pod, and they create a PVC, and if this PVC is net volume, and the, the, this net volume is a Cinder, Cinder volume, so the snapshot, uh, so if they want to do the snapshot, they can send a request to the snapshot controller. This snapshot controller can trigger the Cinder to do the snapshot. And later, when the client if, uh, want to recover the data from the snapshot, they can send us request to the snapshot controller too. And the, the snapshot controller can make one of snapshot via volume, send the volume, and return the volume ID to the controller. The controller then return the UUID to the snapshot client. So when user get this uh, uh, volume UUID, uh, it can create another pod uh, by specify this uh, volume's UUID in the PVC and create another uh, Cinder volume PV, and this uh, new pod can use the, this recovery date. And this is uh, our backup solution uh, in Kubernetes. Okay, lastly, uh, I will give a simple introduction of our future work. Uh, first is that uh, um, we, we need to align our code with the upstream of local volume. Uh, Especially two weeks ago, upstream has uh, merged uh, uh, topology aware volume scheduler PR. So I think most of our required feature of local volume has been upstream. So later we will need to do some work to align our implementation with upstream implementation. And the second part is that uh, uh, we need to do some disk and partition modeling during our node provision. So, so that the purpose is that uh, we can support uh, multiple uh, hardware SKU uh, in our production uh, during the node provision so that we can, uh, during the provision we can use in this module to specify which uh, uh, disk or partition can be used in the local volume. Uh, it will be more generic solution. The third uh, point is that uh, uh, we will consider Z volume for the local disk. Uh, we want to take advantage of uh, the powerful file system ZFS, and some of the features of ZFS maybe will help us uh, uh, to enhance our for local uh, volume, something like snapshot, uh, this kind of feature. Okay, so this is all for, for my introduction. Thank you.